how they deal with it. I'm on your side. Well, good morning. Um, welcome, and thank you all for coming. Um, I want to introduce again Neil. I'm not going to do much of an introduction, but I want to tell him how sincerely thankful we are for him to come and to give all of these lectures and to share his wealth of knowledge with us in such a wonderful and different manner than you normally get it. It's a wonderful perspective. Um, I also wanted to remind everyone, um, we had Neil's opening for his art sculptures, for all of his uh, sculpture work. It's up in the concrete room, um, and it will be up and on display through the 15th of April. Um, it will be open Monday through Friday, nine to five-ish. Um, and if you are wanting to see it at a different time, if you've got folks coming in on the weekend, give Neil a call, and I'll put that information on the door up there. Give him a call and he can potentially come up on a weekend and uh, walk you around with some folks if you would like to see it. Um, but anyway, just our sincere thank you. Um, and then this is the final one in our Renaissance lecture. So we will have a break until sometime in the fall uh, when we'll be back with the next series of lectures. Um, but please enjoy, and thank you so much, Neil. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jenna. Well, remember as we started this... Is this on? Yeah, you, you folks can hear me. Um, when we started this series of lectures on the Renaissance, I said this is really the beginning of the modern world. It may not seem uh, very modern to you starting in 1400, but in fact, most of the assumptions that we all bring with us uh, start in the uh, Renaissance. And um, we're all pretty much used to the idea of a divided Christian faith. Uh, basically, in the modern world, divided three ways. The, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and the Protestant Church. Um, these divisions, the most dramatic being the Protestant and the Roman Catholic, happened in the Renaissance. Um, we're looking at the 1500s today, and uh, Luther put his uh, theses on the door of Wittenberg Cathedral in uh, 1517, I believe it was. And uh, before then, Gutenberg developed the uh, printing press in the mid-1400s. And the combination of Luther's uh, break with the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the printing press really started to shape what we think of as a modern world. Um, keep in mind, all written material before uh, the Renaissance was generally Greek or Latin. It was not in the language of the people. With Luther's interest, in uh, sort of clarifying the faith as he thought of it and bringing it directly back to the Bible, he felt it was necessary to make written material available in the vernacular, in the language people spoke. So Luther translated the Bible he probably, we don't know the version he translated from, but it was probably Greek. Uh, in, the, in the classical time, before the time of Christ, 
uh, the Greco-Roman culture took the Old Testament and translated it into Greek. Um, and so we know he started with, it was called the Septuagint because there were 70 scholars that had translated the Old Testament. So we know he had the Old Testament in Greek, and we also know the New Testament was written exclusively in Greek. So he probably had Greek from both um, sources. Any case, it, by 1534, he had the Bible translated, and now it became available for the whole culture, not just for the church, for the whole culture. Uh, now, of course, as a part of that whole emphasis, you start to get pressure for what we take for granted, which is universal education. Before this time in the medieval era, the only people who uh, could read and write, even emperors, couldn't read and write typically, were a churchman. Now all of a sudden you have pressure for the lay people to be able to have direct encounter with the biblical witness. And, and so that really becomes a just absolutely fundamental shaping thing. <coughs> Now, I want you to be aware of the fact, though, and we've talked about this a little bit earlier on, it wasn't just Luther who started to question some things about the Catholic Church. There were all kinds of internal questions that were going on. The founding of the Franciscan Order and the Dominican Order were both attempts for the Catholic Church to purge the mon monastic uh, community. They were both what we call mendicant orders. The monasteries became extraordinarily wealthy. They inherited all kinds of land and so on. And the mendicant orders started to pay attention. They uh, took vows of poverty and started to care about the ordinary people who, uh, who, who didn't account for anything in, uh, in the, the large cultural patterns, but they accounted for something in the biblical witness. And so, so they were reading the, uh, the Bible, especially fifth chapter of Matthew, the Sermon on, on the Mount, and started to say, wait a minute, you know, Jesus blesses the poor, he blesses the hungry, he blesses the weak. What's the church doing about that? So don't assume this was just an uh, outsider kind of viewpoint coming from uh, Luther. There were all kinds of inner concerns in the church as well. Now we're going to start with a uh, German work today. Remember our focus today is on Northern Europe. We're moving away from Italy. There was a lot of interaction between the Italians and the Northern Europeans. But as I said before, when we started off this series of lectures, if you remember, we started with Northern realism. So we're finishing off again with the, uh, the North. There's going to be all kinds of evidence of the Italian Renaissance in the North, but as you'll see today, and especially in this first work we're going to look at, there is a unique Northern uh, flavor to it. Okay, let's take a look at the Isenheim altarpiece by Matthias Gunwald. Um, this is a typical northern altarpiece that would be at the front of the church. Uh, remember, in the north, you have the Gothic style dominant, so there's, and stained glass windows, so there is really no place to do painting in the, in the church other than in the altar area. 
Now this particular altarpiece has a really uh, unique uh, history because it, it was placed, designed to be placed in what was a Renaissance hospital. At this point, the medical profession had not separated from the church, so the church became the ministry point for sickness. The, uh, the, and by the way, the, uh, the buildings themselves were just great halls, rather like a typical church, uh, and there, there are no private rooms, just beds all around the hall. And this particular uh, medical facility treated a disease called St. Anthony's Fire. It was a disease uh, that we now know was uh, uh, caused by uh, tainted wheat, but it caused gangrene and, and sometimes eventual uh, cutting off of limbs. And the way these uh, spaces were organized, you have all these beds sort of around the, the edge of the hall, and services are conducted here because the patients can't generally leave their beds. So you have an altar at the front of this hall. So it's rather like we think of a apse to a church. This particular altarpiece was located there. Uh, the image you see here, of course, is obviously of the uh, crucified Christ. And then uh, you have these wings of the altarpiece, and uh, you have St. Anthony on the right, and I think you have St. Sebastian on the left. You see the arrows there, St. Sebastian was one of the uh, Christian martyrs. And uh, in the, the center panel itself, you have the figure pointing it to the crucified Christ, and he's holding the Bible open. That's uh, John the Baptist. Remember, he's a forerunner of the Christ. He's pointing to Christ, and typically, at the foot of the cross, you almost always have a representation of the disciple John and his mother Mary. This figure down here in uh, prayer and anguish is identified generally as Mary Magdalene. Now notice the uh, peculiar scale relationships in this image. The, the Christ, is bigger, physically bigger, than these other figures. He's about seven feet tall. That's what we call a heroic scale rather than a uh, colossal scale. So he's represented as this heroic figure, but notice the uh, greenish cast to his skin, and you can if you, we don't get a lot of detail here, but you see all kinds of marks of scourging and everything on his body. You get some sense of that down in this lower panel where they're preparing him for burial. The whole idea is this image represents Christ understands the suffering of these people around the perimeter of this hall. And uh, it becomes an image of suffering and at the same time an image of comfort. Now, because this hospital, if we'll call it that, is church-related, uh, the church here plays a role in uh, everything that happens there. And can we see the next image? We're preparing for Easter. This is Gunvald's uh, 
image of uh, the resurrected Christ. You can see how uh, he understands space, he understands dark and light, he understands all the things we associate with the uh, Renaissance, but the feel and tone of this work is completely different from anything you would associate with the Italians. I love this image. You've got a soldier here who's sort of uh, swooned. This one is falling. He hasn't quite hit the ground yet. So he's sort of, we're getting a foreshortened view of him. And of course, you get this amazing image of the same Christ that we saw on the reverse side. Now with this penumbra of light around him and with the hands raised in a victorious kind of uh, salute to the world of victory. And the, uh, the whole upper, the face and the body and the hair are all illuminated by that penumbra. But of course he places it in this dark environment. So it becomes really bright colors against these dense darks and it creates a kind of bright, jarring, activist kind of effect. Now both of these views, one of them as tragic as it can get and one of them as buoyant and victorious as it can get, are examples of what I'm calling German Expressionism. I had earlier in the medieval era showed you a German wooden pieta of the suffering Christ in Mary's lap. And again, it was just terrible expressions, not glorious, not uh, classical looking at all. So you can see German expression is we're gonna pick up again uh, another year from now when we finally get to the 20th century on these lectures. But it's an inherent tendency in, um, in German intensity. Now, can we see the next one, please? Albrecht Dürer is sometimes called the uh, Leonardo of the North. He was a very gifted artist who, uh, like uh, da Vinci, uh, was interested in a lot of different things and very capable in a lot of different things. Uh, this is, and, and uh, this is in fact one of his early paintings. Um, and you should be aware of the fact that he is one of the examples of the first Protestant artist. As far as we know, Gunvald uh, was not uh, Protestant. Uh, Jura, however, was. Now let me explain a little bit about past history to bring you up to speed on this. Last time we looked at St. Peter's Cathedral. To build St. Peter's, which became the largest church in Christendom, cost vast amounts of money. The only way to raise that money to, is to send priests throughout the empire selling what were called indulgences. Indulgences were little certificates that gave you some time released uh, from pur purgatory. Again, purgatory is an extra biblical uh, teaching of the Catholic Church. It's not a part of Protestant theology. Anyway, they would sell these things uh, in order to, to raise money to build St. Peter's Cathedral. Ironically, as I mentioned, uh, Michelangelo, uh, who was the primary architect for St. Peter's, was actually very sympathetic to the Protestant cause. 
Uh, we know that from various writings and some of his poems and so on. In any case, Durer becomes a, a follower of Luther, and so he creates really the first body of what we call uh, uh, Protestant art. This particular uh, grouping, as you can see, is called the Four Apostles. I might add, it's, uh, that's a misnomer because one of the figures represented here is not an apostle. Uh, let's start on the, uh, the left panel. You, here you have St. John, who was because of the Gospel of John and Luther's very strong affinity for that Gospel, becomes a dominant figure here. Behind him, you have the figure of St. Peter. But now remember, Peter is supposed to be the first uh, pope in Rome. And so the whole idea is he's representing a Protestant figure in front of a Catholic figure. Now this panel over here gives us a kind of misnomer because we supposedly have the uh, Apostle Paul and the evangelist Mark. Ironically, this thing is uh, kind of skewed. If you've read the book uh, of Acts carefully, you've discovered that Mark and Paul did not get along well. In fact, there was a missionary journey that Luke was uh, with Paul and Mark. Eventually, Mark left them. He, he didn't get along very well at all with Paul. So here we have Paul next to Mark. Mark, of course, is not an apostle. Uh, he's an evangelist. Uh, but in any case, uh, what you, you notice, these are just people dressed in older costumes that uh, Jer tried to associate with biblical era. Notice no halos. There, you're going to find as we look at northern art, uh, there's, you, you, we don't see many angels. Uh, we see things represented in a very material way. And the symbols we, we're going to find are what I call secular symbols. They aren't necessarily associated directly with the church. Okay, can we see the next one, please? This is a wood engraving by Jer. He was, his father was a goldsmith. So he was trained in uh, very, uh, doing very delicate work. A wood engraving is a unique form of creation that really starts in this period. First of all, you have to have a printing press before you, you can have engraving. So the printing press has now been developed. And a an engraving, it's different from what we call a woodcut. A woodcut is a board lying flat, and then you, you uh, carve into that surface, creating depressions, and you ink the high spots, uh, and you get a rather broad black and white pattern. A wood engraving is done quite differently. Now the wood is put on end, and those of you who've done carpentry know that end grain is much, much harder than surface grain of wood. So they, the wood is on end, so it's very hard, and therefore it can take a very delicate line. There's a tool called a burin, which is basically a steel tool with a wooden handle, and you scratch uh, V-shaped gouges in that surface. Then you ink it up, and you get an exact reverse image of what you've created on that plate. Uh, Jer became a master of that technique. 
and it allowed his art to become dispersed throughout Europe because with printmaking you can have multiple originals. That uh, first painting I showed you is in the uh, Nuremberg Town Hall and it's only one spot. But all of a sudden his images, his engravings can go everywhere. Now let me help you understand something that most modern people get confused. A print is regarded as an original work of art. It's different from what we call a reproduction. If you go downtown to the museum, you'll see all kinds of images you can buy down there, which are photographic reproductions of paintings in their collection. Because they're photographic and they are not controlled by the original artist, they are almost valueless, although the price is uh, $16 is what you're going to pay for a matted image down there, uh, are, is not quite valueless. In any case, a print is regarded as an original work because the artist has created the plate and the artist has supervised the printing of the plate, and so it's designed to be original. The other thing to keep in mind, the surface you're printing on is what we call paper today, but it's a very specialized form of paper uh, that's very different from this paper that you're looking at up here. It's what we call rag paper. This paper is made from trees that have, and naturally its color would be the color, the brownish color of uh, grocery bags, at least the old day before they had plastic grocery bags. Uh, but that's a natural color of paper because it's made out of wood, and that's the color of wood. To get it white, you actually bleach it, uh, and the problem with these bleaches is eventually they deteriorate the paper and so on. But rag paper is made very differently. It's made usually from linen rags, and uh, it generally does not change color. So we have, I've seen original Jira prints, and the paper they're on is as white as it was the, the day they were printed. Now I might add good rag paper because of the way it's made, is extraordinarily expensive. It's not a big deal at all to pay $20 or so for a piece of paper uh, because of the way it's made. Anyway, this is an example of how the printing press all of a sudden changed the nature of the world. All of a sudden images which the ordinary person had no access to at all now become available to them. And so art becomes something that uh, is for everyone, just, not just for the elite. Now what we have here is Jure's idea of classical figures. As you can see, this of course is Adam and Eve, but they don't look like classical Italian figures. It's, uh, it's uh, just simply uh, a much more northern realistic presentation. It's, uh, remember all along when we talked about northern art, we said the dominant emphasis there is not classicism but realism. Now the thing that makes, definitely makes them not classic is he puts them in a northern forest surrounded by northern animals. Um, and these animals, in fact, I'm going to highlight them for you, become symbolic. These are examples of what I call secular symbolism. You have a cat across from a mouse here. That indicates a certain kind of antagonism and tension that becomes symbolic of the problem be problems between Adam and Eve. 
In the background, you have an elk, and he represents one of uh, the scientific understanding at the time, thought of human character being divided into four units. And the elk represents the melancholic uh, temperament, the person who's subject to depression and sadness. Uh, so you have a uh, melancholic figure here. We have a rabbit representing a uh, much more activist, high energy personality, more like most uh, creative personalities that I've encountered. Remember, I taught creative students my entire career. And then you have the uh, cow in the background. He's supposed to represent the phlegmatic, the phlegmatic or lazy uh, temperament. So you have a kind of rendition of a kind of uh, science vision in this image. So it's not just the biblical image. You, if you look carefully, you see uh, the, uh, the serpent, Eve taking the, Eve, the, uh, the apple from the servant. She also has one on the other hand. And of course, Adam off to the side here. By the way, this little plaque is his signature. Modern days, the artist actually writes in pencil on the bottom of the print. They sign it in pencil, and they, they also put a fraction down there. That represents the size of the addition. The smaller the addition, the more valuable the individual print. So let's say, and different uh, plates withstand printing in different ways. So some plates break down, and so if it's early in the, in the edition, the plate's in good shape. If it's late in the edition, all of a sudden, the plate's breaking down and the image is not as good. So if you're a print connoisseur, one of the things you look for is that, uh, that fraction. Any case, Jerry simply signed his work uh, this way, and notice the exotic bird up in the uh, tree. We have a, uh, what appears to be a parrot as well. I love the, uh, the goat up on the hill here. You guys probably can't see this. I've seen the original print. That's a, uh, a goat up on the, uh, the mountaintop up there. Anyway, you look at the level of detail, imagine how much work it would take to carve an image like that on a block of wood. Now can we see the next one, please? As I've mentioned uh, before, the uh, projection process we use here tends to diminish colors, so you don't get the full color and value range that is apparent in most textbooks. This represents probably as good a representation as I could give you of what uh, I call Protestant theology, uh, the idea of God in creation rather than separate from creation. So any, anything in creation is now worthy of artistic uh, treatment. So Durer simply digs up a hunk of earth and very, very carefully draws and renders it. So if you know plants, if you know wildflowers, you can identify all the plants that, that are here. But the idea that you take something humble like that, and all of a sudden, that's important too. Forget about you know thousands of angels and clouds and so on. God can be here too. Doesn't have to be in all this other things. This is a more Protestant kind of sensibility. And can we see the next one, please? 
This is probably Durer's most famous print. Uh, Night, Death, and the Devil. Notice his nameplate is down here. And the whole idea here is the, uh, this, rep this becomes a sort of secular image representing the idea of Christian faith. It's in Ephesians that Paul talks about taking on the whole armor of God. And you notice this figure is, uh, has armor, and notice he looks straight ahead, even though we have this image of the devil here, and here is uh, death. Uh, death is this decaying skull waving a, uh, uh, a uh, hourglass, and his head is surrounded by snakes. Here, this gruesome image over here represents the devil. His faithful dog, like him, just looks straight ahead. He just looks straight ahead, doesn't look to the side. He's not distracted by all the things that are happening. And by the way, notice he's on this magnificent horse. As far as we know, Leonardo drew some giant horses. In fact, cast in bronze a giant horse that eventually got melted down. As far as we know, Durer saw that. He traveled to Italy, and this particular horse image is probably, in some sense, related to Leonardo's image. The figure of death, notice, is on a uh, beat-up mare, uh, and so the whole idea is a major contrast. A uh, beautifully uh, composed image Again, nature everywhere. You have what appears to be some sort of a, a lizard or something down in the ground. Uh, you actually have this building back here. Is that a castle or is that a church? What I'm trying to point out to you is this is a Protestant image. The figure is all by himself. There's no church there supporting him. There's no panoply of angels and so on. He's all by himself. The whole idea of the individual and the biblical witness is the fundamental Protestant idea. Uh, and the Catholic Church had what at the time was called its teaching office, which allowed it to teach things that were not exactly in the Bible, like indulgences. And those were the, because Luther was a biblical scholar, those were the things that he, uh, he reacted to. And by the way, these prints nowadays are worth, who knows, thousands and thousands of dollars. I remember at uh, Wittenberg, we had a, uh, a Rembrandt print that we showed in our library, and I helped uh, display it. It was a print about four or five inches by three or four inches, and it was evaluated thousands and thousands of dollars. And uh, so those things all of a sudden take on huge value, especially if they're old and most of the edition is destroyed. Can we see the next one, please? Now we're moving to uh, England, and we're looking at a work by Holborn, who was a, uh, he is, his origins were in the Low Countries, but eventually he moved to England and became a court painter there. And this, of course, is, uh, French ambassadors that he's representing. He's uh, uh, working in this very meticulous uh, northern realistic style, but again, the image is full of all kinds of, of symbolism.
first of all, that you notice how these figures are very distinct physiognomies. So they look different. The portraits are realistic renditions of these two guys. But they're leaning on this table, which has all kinds of objects on it. This is now the time of exploration. So uh, you have a globe here. Uh, some people regard this lute as symbolic uh, because it has a broken string. And uh, the string sort of is representing some of the conflict that has brought into European society by the Reformation. The book open here has a uh, Lutheran hymn in it. So anyone who knew, you know, the symbolism of the age could see this, not just as a secular image, but a religious image. But here's something totally weird that no art history book I've ever read has explained very adequately. This weird shape here, if you take a mirror and foreshorten it, it's a human skull. It's actually a very careful, uh, accurate rendition of a human skull, but it's all smeared out on the floor here, and why that's there, I don't know, and the books that I'm uh, looking at don't uh, really say very much about it. But you see how these guys represent what we call secular power. They're ambassadors. Now uh, uh, the church is no longer controlling the political structure of the world. We're getting the development of monarchies and with monarchies relationships between one kingdom and another and therefore you need ambassadors. Now can we see the next one please? Some of you might have seen this spot here. This is the interior courtyard of the Louvre. Now the Louvre was originally a castle. Uh, it was just an elaborate uh, princely home and eventually became a museum. Now you want to keep in mind it was the French who developed the Gothic style. So the Gothic style was persistent in France well into the Renaissance. They were making Gothic buildings in the mid-1500s in France. So the Gothic style kind of dominated things. And it took a while, uh, uh, it took the French a while to start to appropriate the classic style from Italy. And the Louvre courtyard is one of the uh, beginnings of that classic style. Uh, it's, if you look at it, you, you could swear you, you, you might have uh, seen it in Italy, but it's really a beautiful um, image. Lascaux is the architect, uh, and you notice how he breaks the floors apart, so he creates this arcade in the lower floor which creates, because those windows are inset, deep shadows on the uh, lower floor and makes it look darker and therefore as if it's heavier so it can support the weight of this grouping of uh, more rectilinear window, windows in the middle floor. And then you finally have what is typically called the attic story. It's the same story if you look carefully at our image of uh, St. Peter's Cathedral. St. Peter's has an attic story just like uh, the Louvre does. Notice the sculptural work up here. In a moment we're going to see some of the sculptural work done by this particular artist, but typically the French uh, do a lot of ornamentation on top of the classical style. 
It's a beautiful, organized piece of architecture, and I'm trying to set you up for awareness of French style, because you notice in our whole discussion of the Renaissance, this is really but the first French thing we've looked at. And today we think of the French as these arty people. In fact, they, uh, they were not during the Renaissance. The Gothic style pretty much dominated everything, and it took them a while to start to move away from that. Now can we see the next one, please? What you're seeing is a double image. This is a fountain, Fountain of the Innocents, by the same architect. But you'll notice below the uh, text there, Goujon is the sculptor. And you have actually, originally, I think the fountain had six of these maiden, maidens. Um, they're all having uh, vases and uh, pouring water. If you look carefully, each one has a vase and water is, is coming out of each one. And notice, again, they just beautiful, elegant styles. Some of the body types, the heads are relatively small. They aren't quite classical body. These are done, if you look at these dates, these are dates that are similar to the, uh, the development of mannerism in Italy. So these body proportions are partly mannerist. But you'll notice they're just beautiful designs. They're, they're, they're not meant to be all that expressive. Uh, the French, for much of their history, uh, are gifted at this kind of very careful intellectual control of design. I think it's ironic that we think of French as romantic. I, I, the reason I personally think of it that way as ironic is my father's side of the family were all French. And uh, accountants were what they did. Uh, they were the least romantic people that uh, I ever met in my life. I, now, in my experience, of course, they are highlighted by the drama of my mother's family, who are all Irish Catholic and loved a good time. And uh, they were the most friendly, happy, joyous people I ever met. I loved to visit my mother's family. My father's family was no fun at all. They were very strict Protestants. My dad, who smoked a lot, he couldn't smoke at home. They never drank. They never swore. Uh, they were just no fun at all. Uh, anyway, that's, the, that's my experience with French. Uh, and, and the French, in fact, are, is a very organized culture, very organized society. Now can we see the next one, please? Peter Bruegel is an artist from the Netherlands. I have to admit, he's, uh, he's one of my, my favorites. Um, he has, uh, it's hard to place uh, Bruegel because uh, the imagery is imagery that couldn't have been produced in the, uh, in the Gothic or medieval era. The imagery is, and the way it's rendered, is clearly Renaissance, but the overall effect is much more Protestant in character. This is a Return of the Hunters. Um, it has many names. By the way, when we're talking about these titles, uh, it's only in the modern era that artists put titles on their work. The titles that we see are simply put there by art historians in, in a descriptive way. It's fairly rare that an artist in the Renaissance would actually title their works. 
Anyway, you've got these hunters coming back from the hunt. Uh, you don't see uh, examples of a lot of uh, animals that they're carrying with them, so it may not have been a successful hunt. And they've got all their dogs with them. You, you get an amazing contrast. If you look in the background here, you see this house and some kind of a fire going on in front of it. People are maybe cooking supper or something outside here. Uh, anyway, the hunters are coming back from the hunt and you notice how they're kind of looking down. They look kind of weary. They're like a long day in the woods without uh, getting uh, much in return. But notice they're on this hillside and they're heading down a hill. Notice the rhythm of trees. Bruegel creates as these trees get smaller as we go down the hill. And he contrasts that weariness with the fun people are having in town uh, skating in the pond. Uh, and notice he gives us this hilly landscape, especially these mountains in the background. Now if you go to the low countries, the reason they're called the low countries is there are no mountains there. Those mountains are Italian and Swiss, and he in fact visited Italy and visited Switzerland. But that's about the only place you'll see any influence from those countries in his work. He, uh, he just loved nature and he loved common people. He's anti-aristocratic. That whole idea of anti-aristocratic is a Renaissance idea and an elaboration of Protestantism. And now can we see the next one, please? You're going to probably want me to explain this image. And in fact, I won't be able to do that because it has over 100 uh, uh, folk tales and proverbs illustrated in it. Um, and there's one in the background here, you can't see it very clearly, but he made a separate painting of this image here. It's an image of the blind leading the blind. And apparently that culture had all these folk tales that sort of were kind of folk wisdom. Remember, these are generally people who are not aristocratic, they, they can't read, and so they developed this indigenous uh, culture. And uh, you'll notice this painting, although it's got a, a slightly more cheerful look about it, looks a little bit like a painting we saw from the same part of the world that had a much darker theme to it. Remember Bosch's Garden of Delights? And remember Bosch represented his figures as quite small. And given uh, how much he's representing here, it's obvious these figures are also small. And in doing all these strange activities, that whole idea of the emergence of imaginary imagery that we call today surrealism, that whole idea pretty much starts with a guy like Bosch and persists in, uh, in a lot of folk art. Any case, you can see he's, a, again, a really gifted artist in terms of representing uh, uh, imagery and stories, but uh, I, I couldn't begin to unwrap all of these folk tales that you, you see here. But the very fact, you know, like what are these pies doing on a roof. I s assume there's some important folk tale associated with that. Apparently, one of the texts I've read uh, shows this guy, he, there's a blue column here and he's chewing on it. And it's some metaphor about futility. Obviously, he's not going to be able to chew through, through this column. 
Now that's about the last image. And that's, we're, with that image, we're uh, leaving the Renaissance. In the fall, uh, I hope to pick up with Broke, Rococo, uh, maybe neoclassical, but I'm not sure we'll get that far because the Baroque period is also a fairly important com complex uh, period. Now, can I respond to any questions? Just about time now. Anyone? Is this yes. Baroque? I'm sorry. Is this considered Baroque? No, no, this would be Renaissance. See the dates, 1559, he's right in the middle of 1500. Broke isn't, we really don't get into broke until we get into the 1600s. Um, on the engravings, about how large are they? Are they? They're, no, they're, uh, I would say, and I, did we have a measurement on that image? The, the, I, think I, that, I think it's about a foot wide and maybe 14, 15 inches high. Does, does it, uh, no. it doesn't show there. But yeah, typically they're, they're decent size. Uh, in fact, I had a book of, of his, uh, his prints and it was represented in that size range in that, in that book. Anything else I can help you with? Well, thank you all for coming. Have some goodies as you, uh, as you leave here. Thank you. Hope to see you in the fall.